Okay, first a show of hands. Uh, how many of you are designers? That would? Yes. Okay. How many of you are developers? So it's a developer centric crowd. So, um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, uh, the process that I have tried, you know, in uh, into of my last job. Uh, I employed a little bit and I found it working pretty well. Uh, it's a process that will help designers and developers work pretty much in parallel, right? So, uh, as we go through the session, we'll just I'll cover. It. So let me start with a little bit of me, uh, myself, uh, and that's my online moniker, the uh, You know, I, I head the front end team in HP right now. Before HP, I was with uh, Yahoo, and before that, with Nokia. That's pretty much my background. I'm a front end guy all throughout my career, which I've been doing about 14 years. And uh, I've been doing just the presentation layer and the controller layer all my life. Most of my life, at least. So, um, prototyping. What is prototyping? I know most of you, uh, like two years ago, when I would do a talk like this, I have to start from this line. What is prototyping? Because most people, I think, they have just heard of the term in the context of mostly automobile, concept car, but rarely in the software world. But the situation has changed now, right? Most of you understand what's prototyping, I believe. How many of you work in firm where prototyping is used as a practice for daily work? It's still a minority. Now you know how difficult it's for you know for me to get a job, right? I'm a prototyper. I don't have a role wherever I go, but yeah. Um, in my idea, prototyping is about making ideas and design ideas, right? Because when designers put the put on their imaginative hats and you know like start working, turning on design, they don't turn out pretty cool stuff. But around 60 to 70 percent of it usually ends up being just a rainbow, which can never be made into reality. Right? At least that's what we keep hearing from engineering and this is cool, this is nice looking, but you know, it can't be done. Not with the technology that we are working on. Right? This is something that most designers have heard in their daily life. So uh, that's what prototyping is about. Thank you. So uh, in this session, we talk a little bit about how designers can use some prototyping techniques to actually generate uh, production quality front end code without actually writing code. You have to write code, but you know you don't really have to be a front end guy to do it. That's that's pretty much what we are trying to do. <coughs> So what would you say is a good prototype? I mean, I have seen people call Photoshop mocks a prototype. Photoshop mocks tied together with hotspots, they are also called prototypes. Anything done with Dreamweaver is called a prototype. Anything done with Azure is called a prototype. People do prototypes with PowerPoint. But are those the kind of prototypes that we are talking about? I am going to be talking about, in the, within the context of software, I am going to be talking about real prototypes which are high fidelity prototypes which have got production quality code in it. Right? So how do you like judge a prototype? A prototype generation has to be really If you are trying to generate a prototype and it's going to take two months for you to do that, it's not a prototype. You are writing something else. It has to be quick. An average span I would say is one to two weeks for any prototype for a prototyper to take design to production. To make that, they shouldn't take more than one to two weeks. And if it's not done within one to two, two weeks, it's not a prototype anymore. So the turnaround process should be very quick. It should be iterated. You should be able to go back to the drawing board at every stage and make changes as the designer's whims and fancies go. Right? You build something and the designer comes back and says, oh, that blue color is bad, we should try out a different shade of blue. And you say, ah, oh, it's difficult to do, then it's not a prototype. Right? Your prototype should be iterated. It should be quick, it should be developed in one to two weeks of time, it should be iterated. Right? Now, it should also be pixel perfect. You should be able to open up a Photoshop mock in one screen, 
and the actual prototype and another screen, then you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between these two. It should be pixel perfect. Every pixel on the screen should match. If you've got a header there, if it's 12 pixels in the Photoshop log or the PNG or the illustrator that file that I've given you, your, your prototype should have 12 pixels. If it's 12.5 pixels, it's not perfect. Right? Now, I'm just going through the kind of a list of things that I would judge a prototype with. And then let's talk about how to get there. Yes. Not Photoshop file loaded into the browser. I'm talking about Photoshop file or illustrator output and written code. HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We are talking in the context of the web-based user interfaces. Now, you, you, sh you should be able to take this and apply it to any programming language. Even if you're building something in C Sharp or in a .NET platform, if it's thick line, you should be able to apply the same principles. But most of the time, I keep referring back to the web because this is meta refresh, right? Most of the guys here are working on web-based patterns, but that's one, right? It should work with real data. This is very important. Unless you have prototype, works with real data as in the data that you put in lorem ipsum is not a real data right if you have a list of employees listed in the user interface it should actually have a first name middle name and a last name if it doesn't have that then you are playing with imagination because the moment you take this ui and plug in back and code it to video things it will break because you have not allocated the right kind of Right amount of space for the data. Things like this would happen. So it is very important to use real data. Now, how we would use real data, we'll get there. Right? It's very important to use real data. The flows should be complete. If it's a login flow, it should have login, fail, login success, forgot password, and even sign up if it's needed. The flows should be complete. It is important that you have the flows to be complete to be called a prototype. Otherwise, it's still somewhere in the realm of low fidelity, high fidelity wireframe. It should be small and portable. So this is where I would say a classic engineering prototype differs from a design prototype. Now, if you look at an engineering prototype, what will happen is you find you the engineers have built something, but and you send it, you want to send it to a customer or a marketing person who is like you know in some other country you have to set up a server there you have to set up a database you have to set up configure the http conf file <coughs> and a lot of bullshit before you can see the first screen if your prototype requires that then it's not a prototype right your prototype should be you should be able to pack it up zip it up mail it to somebody and they should be able to run it locally now imagine, I've been talking about full flows, real data, you know, working code, and I'm saying that we should be able to pack it up and send it to somebody. Now this is not really possible. Engineers understand that this is not really possible without a web server in the picture. But there are ways to do that. So that's what we'll be talking about. It should almost be production quality. Your HTML that you write in there, it shouldn't be Dreamweaver quality. That's what I want to write. It shouldn't be the drag and drop machine generated HTML. It should be standard compliant HTML. Why? Because unless you are writing good code, your prototype is really not reflecting the actual product that you are going to make. Right? So, most time when prototypes are built, I have seen people cook up something with Dreamweaver, with, with whatever tools they have, and then you know, somehow package it and sell it. When engineers start to write code for it, the whole game changes. because when they write standards compliant code, there are browser compatibility issues when you write CSS, they, uh, you know, stuff that wouldn't work in all browsers and all that. And, you know, eventually what is compromised is the user experience or the design. So your product type shouldn't have any of those additional stuff, in it, which means the designer has to understand the domain, the requirement, the client and the infrastructure that the client has. Clearly, as much as a guy, as an engineering architect does, before building or designing an application, right? This is even more important in the context of web applications and the device applications, right? 
I said a bunch of stuff here, right? Digital so, which I don't think move forward with product. Now, how do we get there? Now, we cannot get there with just static HTML with some images put in. We can't get there with that. How do we do it? So, back there, in the last like four or five years, we have seen this framework emerging, which are called its templating framework. Now, what's a templating framework? Templating framework is just any third party libraries that are available out there. There are billions of them. It, it, it's a library that allows you to write HTML code with a little bit of placeholders for real data and generate a prototype which will look and behave just like the original code without actual data talking to the product UI. And at the same time, when you pull out the dummy data and plug in the backend, the UI should just work. Right? If you have a user interface which has got a which has got like for example a phone book, you have a list of you know uh, people with their phone numbers in it. In your dummy data, you have got a list of hundred people you know with their phone numbers in it and the UI the prototype works. The moment the engineer pulls out the dummy data and then plugs the actual backend into it, and then he makes an AJAX call to a server which returns a list of usernames and their phone number, the UI shouldn't be touched. The engineer should just make the changes in the JavaScript layer and the HTML layer should just work. It should just work. No changes there. No copy paste business. It should just work. That's what a templating framework helps us do. So now look, let's look at how that really affects design a little bit. <coughs> so uh, Blah 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 blah. Okay, there are two types of uh, you know templating frameworks that I see commonly around right now. There are server side ones and there are client side ones. Uh, the engineers in this group would know. Uh, you would have heard of this. There are templating engines like Smarty, which actually provide server side templating frameworks. But that's not what we are talking about. We are talking about client side templating. When we say client side templating, we are talking about templating using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with a little bit of stuff. So there is something called logicless you know, templating frameworks. What are logicless templating frameworks? Frameworks which do not have business, which do not force you to put business logic inside it. Wherein you can abstract business logic completely from the presentation. Right? You, when you talk about a screen, let's talk about the phone book example, for example. There is a list of employees. You click on one of those employees, you get a details of them, right? This is a very master detail kind of screen, which most of you would have worked on, right? Now if you look at that, the business layer all it does is it gets the data for from the backend server, <coughs> does a little bit of validation and pains the UI. There's a bunch of stuff that's happening on the UI. What pops up, you know, what happens when you click on it, does the row color change? These are the challenges that the defender usually face. Right? And these are the challenges that the engineers are tested with usually when you know when they are trying to when the designers are trying to evaluate the prototype as well, right? They say that color um, has a slightly different shade in my Photoshop now, so you should spend more time looking at the color. While that's not the priority for the engineer. The engineer is more concerned about 100 rows of data versus 2000 rows of data on the end. The wrong shade of, you know, Meravala pink is not really the concern that the, you know, engineer has. But that's the most important factor for the designer, right? So, templating engines, logicless templating engines actually allow you to abstract the back end completely from the when I say even now, when we write HTML and JavaScript code, there is often there is a fair amount of business logic. There are isolated loops put inside the HTML layer, HTML or the JavaScript layer, which actually represent business logic in the back. Template engines actually force you to not use that. When we have a look at the actual template code, I'll show you that. Data features. What is data features? Data features is the dummy data. 
real data which in the form of JSON or XML residing locally will be loaded into the prototype. Right? Now, partials. I should probably touch partials a little bit later. Designer engineering productivity. This is what I was talking about. You know, the priorities for the engineer is quite different from the designer. Right? So, the what is the standard design engineering engagement? The standard model is the designer builds something for three months and then you know creates a PDF file out of it, or and it, it is marked up with a Dreamweaver code sent to engineer, and then the engineering starts working. Right? So this is a lot of time wasted. The engineering has to wait around till the designer has done their work. If there is a way we could run this in parallel, if there was a way I can actually get the designers to start working on the same day that I start writing my engineering code. When I write controller code, if the designer can start writing the printed code at the same time and they check it into the same repository. And if I go and make changes to the design code or if the designer comes in and makes changes to the HTML code, my, my engineering layer or the business logic is not affected, then there is a huge spike in product. Right? So, templating engine frameworks allow you to do that as well. Right? It facilitates more design innovation and experimentation. Let's take the example where you have you you have started working and you are like eight months into production or eight months into development, and one module has already been delivered to the client or it's been live on the web. Now, in a situation like this, the designer comes in and says, "You know that time feature that there on our site, we should try to change it into time." So the usual response is, oh, we can put that into our next release, which is in 2018. By then, the technology is obsolete, the requirement is obsolete, the needs are obsolete. Right? So how can I let the designer go and experiment with his stuff while ensuring that my engineering code is not affected? My business logic is not affected. Right? A framework like that allows you to do this. Let's take a simple example. Let's really get down to code. So this is a template. Most of you understand HTML, right? Here, anybody who doesn't understand HTML? Okay. Thankfully. So this is a classic, right? It's got a first name, second name, city. It's enclosed in a div, three spans with the BR. Standard HTML code. Nobody has any complaints about it. Now, what would the data for this be? Simple JSON file, first name, Uday, second name, Shankar, city, Bangalore, right? Now how do I tie these things together? Let me go back. You see this code here, there's curly braces, first name, second name, and city. Now you'll see that these are the same variables that are used here, right? Now. When you compile that template, when I say compile, it sounds too technical, but it's just about including one JS library in the file. Okay. When you put that in, the returning output would be this generated an HTML. Right? Now, this sounds this is the output that you see on the web browser, right? This sounds too much complicated for just printing two lines of data on the web, right? Now I'll tell you the difference. Let's go back. Code. So, this is the same thing that I showed in the PowerPoint. Okay, let me clear or not? I am sure there is a way to do it, but I have no clue. Which one? Mac Classic. Mac Classic. This one? Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. So this is the same thing. I've got a template here defined here, which is just HTML code, right? It's a string, a simple string of HTML with some placeholders put in, and then I have a separate JSON data here. Now what happens when I do a compile here is this data gets converted to 
this gets merged and the output is what you see here. Right? Simple stuff, but it's way too much code to print to line up there. But imagine a situation wherein I want to print a list of it. Okay? Now let's look at how you that thing. Now, although JavaScript did talk in this slash, I'll talk about it later. Now, if you look at this, look at this part. You have got a heading on the screen, UL, and then an headline, and another heading to here, and close in a script. And I've got a bunch of JavaScript code here. Right? When this compiles, I get this. So why? Why is this powerful? Because now if I want to build six rows out of this, I get that. So if your entire UI is generated with JSON data, which is lying outside your HTML, you can actually go in and make changes to the JSON data and populate dummy data into your UI. It makes a huge difference when you're trying to do it. Huge. Now, even though in the script that you saw right now here, have the script, the HTML, and all of this in the same code. But technically, you can separate this into different files. You can have a JSON file in the machine. You can have a template, and then you can have a HTML file which will follow that template and say that is the data. This is the template. Put it together and print the screen. Now imagine this in a bigger world where you are building two hundred screens. Right now, if you realize what's happening here is. Your template is also an include file, right? Because my template is an individual component. Now think about a situation where you have a yes no button on screen. You have got a screen which has got a workflow of 20 you know, steps, and all the 20 steps have got a yes, previous back, and yes and cancel button. So the standard way of doing it is putting in that HTML code in all the places. Now what you can do with a framework like this is create one template with all the four buttons in it and then reuse that template For designers, the power is you can create one component which is properly designed on the style supply and then reuse them from the screen. While for engineering the power is all of a sudden you have the power of including files in HTML. Which was something engineering has always done in the past. We have always included common components somewhere and we will be reusing. Now we can reuse chunks of HTML code across the UI. Now, especially in the context of an uh, enterprise application, when you have like 600 screens which are using the same template, then the manager comes and tells you, I want this button to look like something else, or I want to change all the checkboxes in, this, in the entire code to be review buttons. You can't make the child change the CSS change. You have to go through the code and make the change, right? If it is coming out of a single partial or component, in the world of uh, you know templating, the component is called a partial. It's a partial part of code, right? So if you if you make a change in the partial, that change is reflected across the UI. This is very powerful. This, this uh, way of actually being able to drill in dummy data split up the UI into multiple components like if you have a left pane, the left pane is one partial, header is another partial and each of them are like populated with different bunch of JSON data. Now if you are if you are in the business of building prototypes, one of the most common requirements is the marketing team uh, coming and telling you, hey that prototype that you built for me last month for that uh, American client, we need to make it work for the Chinese client, so can you change all the blue colors to red color? This is very common, right? Change all the names, uh, John Doe to, uh, you know, what, Louis Chin, right? This is a very common thing, and we end up creating more and more and more of these components. Now, you can just uh, tell them, you, there is a file called with an extension .json, 
it's English, go in and change stuff as you need in the prototype. Right? Now, if you see, I can I can just make a change here, right? I can change this to anchor and go back and change the page. The last item is changed. I have not touched the HTML anymore. I just changed the JSON data. I can do a lot of the, this is just a plain part of it. What I've done. The templating frameworks actually give you more power. They do a lot of stuff. And if you look at the code here, select on and focus on this part. What this denotes is an array. This is specifically for the the development guide. Okay. Uh, this denotes an array. This is where you write for I where you write for the zero, I less than the layer, array dot layer, I plus plus, repeat that thing. Right? All that is taken care of by this small denotation. Now where is this powerful? This is something a designer can practice. Designers won't find it difficult to write this code. I know because I have tried it. Because when I was trying to build my team, uh, I found it very difficult to get the right kind of printed people. So I had to uh, you know, kind of resort to getting an intern to actually work on this. Interns who have got absolutely no background in printing. So maybe not, if you, if you ever go to an intern who has who have no background in programming and trying to tell them there is something called an array and there is a way you can iterate through an array, you are lost. They don't care. Right? But if I tell them that you all you need to do is this, write this, and if you have a list like this, which is the same, which has the same variable, and each item in this list has to have these variables here, they can generate the So what happens here is now I've got a bunch of code which my designers can work on comfortably, they can make changes to. And when I say engineering comes in, all they do is you see this data that's being used here. The only thing that engineering does is pass a variable from the return function of result function of an index part. The UI works. They don't go and change the li here, they don't copy paste ul there, they don't do any of this. The styling, the layout, everything is done by the designer, it's within the control of the designer, the designer continues to own it. If the ui looks bad, it's still the designer's problem, it's not the developer's problem. Because the developer has never touched that. The developer has focused on the backend, the controller layer, and in the presentation layer, they have just ensured that the same variable name is being used when they send the data back to the How much time have you as engineers wasted trying to get that one pixel line at the right spot? Most engineers know what I'm talking about, right? Getting that one pixel line. You know, it, it should be slightly towards the left. You you waste time. The designers are used to that problem. The designers will spend three days trying to fix that one pixel line. They don't have a problem with that because that's their job that they, they enjoy doing. For an engineer, it's a pain. They were like, you know, why why would that one pixel line be so important? I have got more stuff to figure out, right? Now with this kind of a mechanism in place. You can say, hey designer, you take care of the one pixel line. You take care of it. Once you have fixed that, I'm not going to touch that. So there's no question of you fixing it and then I coming and putting in my you know conditional loops in between your HTML and doing it. No. My controller, my business logic will reside completely outside your field. Your HTML is intact. You just check in, keep on checking in HTML, CSS, HTML, CSS, HTML, CSS. And I'll check in JS. And at the end of the day, it will just work. When it comes as an, as an actual problem. 
Now let's talk about a different scenario, slightly different scenario. This is a very common problem that we face, right? We are six months into production. We are the build is breaking today, for example, and we are not able to compile things. And on that day, the director of your organization comes in for a you know, visit from US, and your manager comes in and says, somehow get that finding, I want to show you. What do you do that? Your entire backend is built in broken. This is something that I face in the lot. Here, all I have to do is if I don't send the data available from the backend, the UI will still work because of the data fixture. Right? If I don't send the data variable, the UI is still working because the data is running out of JSON data and it's still there. So what it gives me is a sandbox that I can share with anybody say, you know, hey, here's the status of the current program. And to see this, you don't need a fancy server environment, you don't need anything. All you need is a browser and you copy this zip file somewhere locally and open it and run it inside your browser. Right? It's a very powerful thing. Now, uh, let me go back to this slide there. I think we are running out of time. So, this is the second example I showed you. This is not. I, I showed you the simplest example. Now, what I showed you was two examples. In the two examples I showed you, I used two different frameworks. For this. One is called Mustache. One is called Mustache. And the other one is called handlebars. Now, when I say mustache handlebars, all these are JavaScript. Okay. All these are JavaScript open source libraries available out there. You just have to include these files in your HTML file, and this templating will work. Just as a use case, uh, I don't know how many of you do. Any, does anybody of you use Yahoo Mail or Calendar? Just three guys coming. Okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I, mean, I, I wrote the front end code for Yahoo Mail. So, <laughs> so, so, we had used this templating mechanism for that. The new one, yes. The new one. We, we, we built that entire thing with this kind of a, a templating mechanism. Wherein, so, so what I'm trying to say is, and in the enterprise applications that we are building in HP right now, we are using a similar process. We are using a different bunch of frameworks, but the process is still the same. Right? We have interaction designers, we have visual designers who you know churn out HTML, I mean PDFs after PDFs of wireframes. And based on that, we have HTML designers, frontend designers, who take look at look at that visual design in PSD or in the Illustrator file and churn out HTML code. We are we check in this code directly into the same Git repo as the engineering. And the engineering, all they do is they replace those variables with the data. And in a, in a day, in a day where the engineering code is broken, the UI still continues to work. And uh, my guys, my team can continue working. So this was another problem that we were having in, uh, in many companies that I worked before. Like three months into development, if the backend breaks, the whole frontend team has to like sit down and wait till the backend is fixed because they can't continue. With it. Now they can, right? So handlebars is one. This one is one, and then this this third library. So I just picked up the three most important. Okay, Dust JS, handlebar JS, and Mustache. Now Mustache was built based on the principles of closure templates. See templates that Google had created, right? Now Mustache is logicless. It's very simple, very easy to learn. To give you examples of where you can find Mustache, you could find Mustache in Storyfy.com, in uh, in many of Yahoo websites. Now, Dust is what is being used by LinkedIn. Uh, Handlebars is used by, uh, I believe they are used by AOM, but I'm not very really sure. But so uh, these are like the three, you know, most popular frameworks. If you see the list I have put on top, this is because I, my, I, I got tired of copy pasting. But the list is like three times of this. There are so many templating libraries out there. Each of them do the same thing, but with some bells and whistles. 
Now, why did I pick out DustJS? Is because LinkedIn did a kind of a benchmarking of all the available logicless templating engines and kind of you know kind of published an article on what does what better. And based on that, I felt you know these are the three uh, you know engines that uh, that will work good. Now, how do you choose a right templating engine that will suit you? How do you suit you? Like there are six or seven of these types. The first principle is dry. Uh, dry means uh, it's a, it's a principle. It's called don't repeat yourself. As in one piece of code that you write, if it is used anywhere in a 600 screen UI somewhere, it has to be reusable. If it is not reusable, then that piece of code is a wastage of time. So yeah, your the competing engine you, you choose should support that kind of partial. Right? It should allow you to do stuff dry. It should be designer friendly, as in it should be very simple for the designers to figure out because that's what we are trying to do. Get the designers to do what they do best, get the engineers to do what they do best. Don't try to mix it. I mean, there is this philosophy that I'm hearing pretty recently where people say, be a jack of all trades. We need designers who will prototype, we need prototypers who will do visual design. Nein. No. We don't need to be jack of all trades. We need to do one or two good stuff, we should do it best. Right? I'm not a visual designer. If you ask me to draw a cat on the board, I will suck it. But I'm good at writing JavaScript. But am I the guy who will be able to, you know, kind of fix the problem with jQuery library break? No, I'm not that good. I'm good at building, making designs into reality. And that's what I do. I understand the difference between a one pixel line and two pixel line. I have spent three days trying to fix a line width, right? So that's about design friendly. It should support multiple languages. I mean, it's very important, right? So internationalization should be supported. It should support hot reload. Hot reload is what you saw. You make a change in the code. You go to, to the browser and do an F5 choose code. If it has to go through a build mechanism, that that prototype, that kind of a templating framework is a waste. It should just work if you do a refresh, right? The loading speed shouldn't be, you know, hampered just because you are able to get it. Now, if you look at uh, Twitter, Twitter runs, uh, uses a templating framework called Hogan. What is Hogan? Hogan is just a compiled version of Mustache. Why it's important is because Twitter found out that when their engineering team found out that the UI is getting slowed down because of the amount of data that's coming in and the whole JavaScript file trying to, you know, kind of render data live on time, they realized that this is not going to work for us. So they wrote a compiler for it. What the compiler does is during the build process, the compiler takes all these different templates that have been built, takes all these JSON files, compiles them together into a native JavaScript. And that JavaScript code is used by engineers. Right? So this whole bundling up is done by engineering automation. It's not a human being doing it. So designers can still continue to work on the templates. All they have to do is before as part of the nightly builds, these templates are tied together, stitched together, and compiled into native JavaScript code. So Hogan does that. So learning curve should be less. I have already told it. Productivity, I've already covered it. It should be actively developed. This is a major point. Right? There are so many, you know, JavaScript libraries out there. It's very important to ensure that your the one that you choose should be active as a community around it. That people are developing. If nobody is developing it, then you should probably choose it because three months down the line it's probably going to be obsolete. Right? And you won't get support for what you're doing. So find whether it is, just Google for whether it has got an actual community around it. When was the last chicken made into GitHub for that project? Look at it, if it has been done in the last one month, yes, that's a good option. But it was done in 2007, then maybe you should look at some other engine. Right? Community support, it should be library agnostic, it's very important. If the you know templating framework says, if you want to use this templating framework, you have to use uh, you know, J JavaScript and PC, then it's a bad idea. You should, because tomorrow you may move away from the, you know, controller, uh, JavaScript and PC for the controller. 
right? So you should use a templating engine that is completely JavaScript or library agnostic. And the last point is you should find one which has got an editor support. Check whether there are uh, what do you call code inside available plugins available for uh, you know Coda, TextMate, Notepad plus plus, Sublime Text, whatever you use. Check whether there are, there are plugins available for this, which will make life easier. So final, my recommendation is just so I'll be putting this uh, you know uh, PowerPoint on the meta reference site or somewhere, and it has got a URL here in this slide here which points to the LinkedIn article that I was telling about why they chose just on what principles, on what benchmarks. It is very important, go through it if you are planning to do templating. And uh, that link will work first. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Thank you. If you have any questions, please. What's the Can you be a bit more loud? So, when you 